then drink from me, I said, shuddering at the sight of him. The fangs distended again, the hands out to grasp me, but it was the least I could do. As soon as I was done with that creature, I ordered him to let no one enter the crypt. How the hell he was supposed to keep anyone out, I couldn't imagine. But I told him this with tremendous authority, and I hurried away. I went back into Alexandria, and I broke into a shop that sold antique things, and I stole two fine painted and gold-plated mummy cases. And I took a great deal of linen for wrapping, and I went back to the desert crypt. My courage and my fear were at their peak. As often happens when we give the blood or take it from another of our kind, I had seen things, dreamed things as it were, when the burnt one had his teeth in my throat. And what I had seen and dreamed had to do with Egypt, the age of Egypt, the fact that for 4,000 years this land had known little change in language, religion, or art. And for the first time this was understandable to me, and it put me in profound sympathy with the mother and the father as relics of this country, as surely as the pyramids were relics. It intensified my curiosity and made it something more akin to devotion. Though, to be honest, I would have stolen the mother and the father just in order to survive. This new knowledge, this new infatuation inspired me as I approach Akasha and Ankil to put them in the wooden mummy cases, knowing full well that Akasha would allow it and that one blow from Ankil could probably crush my skull. But Ankil yielded as well as Akasha. They allowed me to wrap them in linen, to make mummies of them, and to place them into the shapely wooden coffins which bore the painted faces of others and the endless hieroglyph instructions for the dead, and to take them with me into Alexandria, which I did. I left the wraith being in a terrible state of agitation, as I went off dragging a mummy case under each arm. When I reached the city, I hired men to carry these coffins properly to my house, out of a sense of fittingness, and then I buried them deep beneath the garden, explaining to Akasha and Enkil all the while aloud that their stay in the earth would not be long. I was in terror to leave them the next night. I hunted and killed within yards of my own garden gate, and then I sent my slaves to purchase horses and a wagon for me, and to make preparations for a journey around the coast to Antioch on the Orientis River, a city I knew and loved, and in which I felt I would be safe. As I feared, the elder soon appeared. I was actually waiting for him in the shadowy bedroom, seated on my couch like a Roman, one lamp beside me, as old copy of some Roman poem in my hand. I wondered if he would sense the location of Akasha and Enkil and deliberately imagine false things that I had shut them up in the Great Pyramid itself. I still dreamed the dream of Egypt that had come to me from the Burnt One, a land in which the laws and the beliefs had remained the same for longer than we could imagine, a land that had known the picture writing in the pyramids and the myths of Osiris and Isis when Greece had been in darkness and when there was no Rome. I saw the river mile overflowing her banks. I saw the mountains on either side, which created the valley. I saw time with a wholly different idea of it. And it was not merely the dream of the burnt one. It was all I had ever seen or known in Egypt. A sense of things beginning there, which I had learned from books long before I had become the child of the mother and the father, whom I meant now to take. What makes you think that we would entrust them to you? The elder said as soon as he appeared in the doorway. He appeared enormous as, girded only in the short linen kilt, he walked around my room. The lamplight shone on his bald head, his round face, his bulging eyes. How dare you take the mother and the father? What have you done with them? He said. It was you who put them in the sun, I answered. You who sought to destroy them. You were the one who didn't believe the old story. You were the guardian of the mother and the father, and you lied to me. You brought about the death of our kind from one end of the world to the other. You and you lied to me. He was dumbfounded. He thought me proud and impossible beyond words. So did I. But so what? He had the power to burn me to ashes if and when he burnt the mother and the father. And she had come to me. To me. I did not know what would happen, he said now, his veins cording against his forehead, his fists clenched. He looked like a great ball Nubian as he tried to intimidate me. I swear to you by all that is sacred, I didn't know. And you cannot know what it means to keep them, to look at them year after year, decade after decade century after century and you know that they could speak they could move and they will not i had no sympathy for him and what he said he was merely an enigmatic figure poised in the center of this small room in alexandria railing at me of sufferings beyond the imagination how could i sympathize with him i inherited them he said they were given to me what was i to do he declared 
and I must contend with their punishing silence, their refusal to direct the tribe they had loosed into the world. And why came this silence? Vengeance, I tell you. Vengeance on us, but for what? Who exists who can remember back a thousand years now? No one. Who understands all these things? The old gods go into the sun, into the fire, or they meet with obliteration through violence, or they bury themselves in the deepest earth, never to rise again. But the mother and the father go on forever, and they do not speak. Why don't they bury themselves where no harm can come to them? Why do they simply watch and listen and refuse to speak? Only when one tries to take Akasha from Enkil does he move. Does he strike out and then batter down his foes, as if he were a stone colossus come to life? I tell you, when I put them in the sand, they did not try to save themselves. They stood facing the river as I ran. You did it to see what would happen if it would make them move. To free myself, to say, I will keep you no longer. Move, speak, to see if it was true, the old story. And... If it was true, then let us all die in flames. He had exhausted himself. In a feeble voice, he said, Finally, you cannot take the mother and the father. How could you think that I would allow you to do this? You, who might not last out the century, you, who ran from the obligations of the grove, you don't really know what the mother and the father are. You have heard more than one lie from me. I have something to tell you, I said. You are free now. You know that we're not gods, and we're not men either. We don't serve the Mother Earth because we do not eat her fruits, and we do not naturally descend to her embrace. We are not of her, and I leave Egypt without further obligation to you, and I take them with me because it is what they have asked me to do, and I will not suffer them or me to be destroyed. He was again dumbfounded. How had they asked me? But he couldn't find words. He was so angry and so full of hatred suddenly, and so full of dark, wrathful secrets that I could not even glimpse. He had a mind as educated as mine, this one, but he knew things about our powers that I didn't guess. I had never slain a man when I was mortal. I did not know how to kill any living thing, save in the tender and remorseless need for blood. He knew how to use his supernatural strength. He closed his eyes to slits, and his body hardened. Danger radiated from him. He approached me, and his intentions went before him, and in an instant I had risen off my couch, and I was trying to ward off his blows. He had me by the throat, and he threw me against the stone wall, so that the bones of my shoulder and right arm were crushed. In a moment of exquisite pain, I knew he would bash my head against the stone and crush all my limbs, and then he would pour the oil of the lamp over me and burn me and I would be gone out of his private eternity, as if I had never known the secrets or dared to intrude. I thought as I never could have before, but my battered arm was a ride of pain, and his strength was to me what mine would be to you. But instead of clawing at his hands as they locked round my throat, instead of trying to free my throat, as was instinctive, I shot my thumbs into his eyes. Though my arm blazed with pain, I used all my strength to push his eyes backwards into his head. He let go of me and he wailed. Blood was pouring down his face. I ran clear of him and towards the garden door. I still could not breathe from the damage he'd done to my throat. And as I clutched at my dangling arm, I saw things out of the corner of my eye that confused me. A great spray of earth flying up from the garden, the air dense as if with smoke. I bumped the door frame, losing my balance as if a wind had moved me. And glancing back, I saw him coming on. Eyes still glittering, though from deep inside his head, he was cursing me in Egyptian. He was saying that I should go into the netherworld with the demons, unmourned. And then his face froze in a mask of fear. He stopped in his tracks and looked almost comical in his alarm. Then I saw what he saw, the figure of Akasha, who moved past me to my right. The linen wrapping had been ripped from around her head, and her arms were torn free, and she was covered with the sandy earth. Her eyes had the same expressionless stare they always had, and she bore down on him slowly, drawing ever closer because he could not move to save himself. He went down on his knees, babbling to her in Egyptian, first with a tone of astonishment and then with incoherent fright. Still she came on, tracking the sand after her, the linen falling off her as each slow sliding step ruptured, the wrappings more violently. He turned away and fell forward, on his hands and started to crawl as if by some unseen force she prevented him from rising to his feet surely that was what she was doing because he lay prone finally his elbows jutting up unable to move himself quietly and slowly she stepped on the back of his right knee 
crushing it flat beneath her foot, the blood squirting from under her heel, and with the next step she crushed his pelvis, just as flat while he roared like a dumb beast, the blood gushing from his mangled parts. Then came her next step down upon his shoulder, and the next upon his head, which exploded beneath her weight as if it had been an acorn. The roaring ceased. The blood spurted from all his remains as they twitched. Turning, she revealed to me no change in expression, signifying nothing of what had happened to him. Indifferent even to the lone and horrified witness, who shrank back against the wall, she walked back and forth over his remains with the same slow and effortless gait, and crushed the last of him utterly. What was left was not even the outline of a man, but a mere blood-soaked pulp upon the floor, and yet it glittered, bubbled, seemed to swell, and contract as if there were still life in it. I was petrified, knowing that there was life in it, that this was what immortality could mean. But she had come to a stop, and she turned to her left so slowly it seemed the revolution of a statue on a chain, and her hand rose and the lamp beside the couch rose in the air and fell down upon the bloody mass, the flame quickly igniting the oil as it spilled. Like grease he went up, flames dancing from one end of the dark mass to the other, the blood seeming to feed the fire, the smoke acrid, but only with the stench of the oil. I was on my knees, with my head against the side of the doorway. I was as near to losing consciousness from shock as I have ever been. I watched him burn to nothing. I watched her standing there beyond the flames, her bronze face giving forth not the slightest sign of intelligence or triumph or will. I held my breath expecting her eyes to move to me, but they didn't and as the moment lengthened, as the fire died, I realized that she had ceased to move. She had returned to the state of absolute silence and stillness that all the others had come to expect of her. The room was dark now. The fire had gone out. The smell of burning oil sickened me. She looked like an Egyptian ghost in her torn wrappings, poised there before the glittering embers, the gilded furnishings glinting in the light from the sky, bearing for all their Roman craftsmanship, some resemblance to the elaborate and delicate furnishings of a royal burial chamber. I rose to my feet, and the pain in my shoulder and in my arm throbbed. I could feel the blood rushing to heal it, but the damage was considerable. I did not know how long I would have this. I did know, of course, that if I were to drink from her, the healing would be much faster, perhaps instantaneous, and we could start our journey out of Alexandria tonight. I could take her far, far away from Egypt. Then I realized that she was telling me this. The words far, far away were breathed in by me sensuously. And I answered her, I have been all through the world, and I will take you to safe places. But then again, perhaps this dialogue was all my doing, and the soft, yielding sensation of love for her was my doing. And I was going completely mad, knowing this nightmare would never, never end except in fires such as that that no natural old age or death would ever quiet my fears and dull my pains as I had once expected it to do. It ceased to matter. What mattered was that I was alone with her, and in this darkness she might have been a human woman standing there, a young god woman full of vitality and full of lovely language and ideas and dreams. I moved closer to her and it seemed then that she was this pliant and yielding creature and some knowledge of her was inside me, waiting to be remembered, waiting to be enjoyed. Yet I was afraid. She could do to me what she had done to the elder, but that was absurd. She would not. I was her guardian now. She would never let anyone hurt me. No, I was to understand that. And I came closer and closer to her until my lips were almost at her bronze throat. And it was decided when I felt the firm, cold press of her hand on the back of my head.